my name is Vabulu Kuyva. Uh, I'm a visiting fellow at the Economic Democracy Initiative, uh, Open Society University Network Visiting Fellow from American University of Central Asia. And I will be moderating, it's my pleasure to moderate this session today. Um, the session this afternoon, the second session is on macroeconomic management around the world. And uh, it's my pleasure to present, to give the floor to our first speaker, Daniela Gaber. Uh, Gaber, she is from the University of the West of England, Bristol. Yes, sir. Thank you. Welcome, the floor is yours. Uh, Daniela will be talking about de risking and the other green microfinance regimes. I am reminded of Slavo Šišek, who just was in the Frankfurt Festival like two weeks, no, three weeks ago, and people applauded when he went on the stage and he said, wait, wait, wait with your applause until I finish speaking. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to be as controversial as he was, <laughs> for very good reasons. Um, but I want to say first that Ben Brown's name should be there, because this is what I'm going to talk about today is mostly uh, based on a paper that we have recently released in the open. It's not published, it's under review. Um, and it's a paper where we think about decarbonization from a critical macrofinance perspective, and I'll tell you in a second uh, what I mean by that. So the context to, to my talk um, uh, is, um, well, there are, there are various uh, uh, policies and various initiatives for decarbonization, uh, explicit or implicit, uh, across uh, the world. Um, probably the most uh, interesting one uh, is the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, which is not always presented as climate policy, but it, it contains a very significant climate uh, element to it. And, and people like Chirag and many others like to point like to point at that vertical line uh, as a evidence that it's triggered a, a renewal in manufacturing investment in, in the United States. The other vertical line that we have seen in manufacturing capacity comes from China. Uh, where uh, um, at least uh, in terms of uh, green technologies, green tech, um, the, the Chinese um, economy has been remarkably good at producing vertical lines in a way that not, other, uh, not many other uh, countries have been, and that has produced quite a bit of geopolitical tension in, Euro in the European Union and, and here as well, uh, in the sense of stoking certain national security concerns about uh, the fact that Chinese, the Chinese are increasingly dominating uh, green tech value chains. Um, on the on the less kind of positive side, so this is what I've told you over the past year, which I guess are, are a, for somebody who's interested in rapid decarbonization or positive signs, uh, what we are seeing is that uh, there is uh, currently a crisis in, uh, in the uh, wind uh, uh, in, um, renewable infrastructure, uh, a lot that has to do with uh, the fact that many uh, wind manufacturers and wind uh, in particular, but not only, uh, are uh, basically struggling with a kind of price arrangements under which they have, uh, which are on, and price contracts that they have entered, particularly with governments, uh, and uh, arguing that market conditions, particularly interest rates, have, uh, interest rates have changed and are adversely affecting their ability to uh, uh, invest at the kind of pace that governments expect them to invest, given the um, decarbonization ambitions, uh, but also to make in general profit. So, how do we make sense? I, I will I will try to convince you today that we can make sense of all these kind of uh, interconnected but also uh, distinct developments through a, an approach uh, or through the um, the um, analytical concept of macrofinancial regimes. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the theoretical uh, framework that comes that uh, uh, sits behind the notion of macrofinancial regimes, which we used to um, discuss decarbonization, and that is de-risking. And de-risking has been mentioned a couple of uh, times today, and I just want to, to clarify that uh, our definition of de-risking, and in general, the, the definition of de-risking that comes from the critical macrofinance literature is about the relationship between state and capital. Right, so we don't. I can't think of the risking labor markets in the same way that I think about the risking when it comes to um, uh, the relationship between state and capital. And I'll give you some examples. And what I mean by the risking, and I think most of the literature follows that, except for uh, the uh, European Union when it talks about China and the risking. But most of the literature and most of policymakers, from Biden, the Biden administration to the U European Commission to uh, the World Bank, when they talk about the risking, what they mean is 
steering price signals, making particular public policy uh, priorities, investable, mobilizing private capital via subsidies, guarantees. You will see contracts for difference, public-private partnerships. There is a <laughs> range of the risking interventions which steer the price signal, but does not fix them. So price, there are no price controls. Uh, there are only interventions in, um, in guiding the price in some direction, right? Which is, in a sense, uh, you will see also the consequence of what we describe to be the monetary dominant status quo, which basically we all know is the central bank is in charge. There is an institutional architecture that says uh, the market has to discover prices one way or another. And of course, there are backstops, and, and maybe this is uh, relevant for the conversation we just had on, on market discipline, but the state in this de-risking regime very rarely fixes prices, except for in the energy markets, it fixes particular prices uh, when it enters purchasing power agreements. So um, where does this uh, de-risking come from? It comes from uh, work that I've done and, and several others on uh, critical macrofinance as an extension of Minskian, uh, but the, not only other post-Keynesian insights, where uh, we, we think about, uh, at an analytical starting point, we think about the interaction between uh, uh, change in financial structures and uh, the macroeconomic institutions of the state. And uh, from that uh, starting point, then, um, structurally, we are in an age where the state, through both its monetary policy institutions, through the central bank, and through its fiscal authorities, has taken the risking or these interventions have become the norm of how the state governs. And I would I would argue, for example, that the backstop that uh, Scott discuss, uh, discussed in the previous uh, session, uh, the backstops to government bond markets are the risking interventions in the sense that they preserve the investability of government bonds, but they do not fix the, fix the price. The intention is to allow the market to discover the price in a, a view of what are uh, perceived to be shorter, expected short-term interest rate movements, but uh, uh, interventions in general have been, and I, we can argue around uh, quantitative easing, whether that's true or not, I think to some extent it is, uh, there is the, the structures of the modern financial system require the state to do the risk in interventions. And the critical in critical macrofinance looks at the political struggles around the structural demands, because not every central bank wants to do the risking uh, and the Eurozone crisis. The Eurozone area is a good example of why the politics of the risking is, is, is more complicated. So um, for, for, with that in mind, um, when we talk about when we try to think about decarbonization pathways, we think about the concept of macrofinancial regimes, which are uh, institutional arrangements, more or less, that, that are defined uh, uh, along five different pillars, coordination mechanisms, the fiscal monetary architecture, the industrial policy architecture, the control over credit flows, and uh, the political economy of the coalitions that are sitting behind and kind of drawing or, or becoming uh, relevant in deciding the pace of you know, industrial policy or, or the type of intervention uh, that we have. And with this, and I'll, I'll spend a lot more time defining them in the next 20 minutes, we have identified four different types of macrofinancial regimes. That is four broad ways under which uh, you can organize decarbonization or uh, 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 transition uh, climate transitions. The first one is climate shock therapy, and I'll tell you more about it. Basically, it says uh, you have to increase carbon prices, uh, but you have to let the market do the job of allocating uh, uh, resources and credit away from uh, fossil fuel sectors, only that there the, are the market failures, and these market failures have to be corrected. Then there is a big green state, where a lot of the activity of decarbonization is done explicitly and directly on the balance sheet of the state for a variety of reasons that I will discuss later. And in between, we have the uh, de risking regimes, which is, and I, probably I'll, I'll spend most of the time discussing this because this is the most easy, uh, the, the regime that is easiest to observe uh, in place in both Europe, uh, the United States, and I would argue many countries in the in the global south. C countries in the global south also fall under uh, carbon shock therapy, particularly when they have now agreements with the IMF or what we are seeing at the World Bank green structural adjustment. And we we when we first presented this, um, people were, were asking, so how did you arrive at these four macrofinancial regimes? Or well, there used to be three, but you will see we've broken them down a, a little bit just to distinguish between 
the kind of typical de-risking interventions that target infrastructure assets and the new de-risking uh, interventions from the US. The US has changed a bit the story that we're telling because, because of the US IRA, which is using de-risking in order to improve manufacturing capacity in uh, strategic sectors in, in the US. Um, and we ca came up with a way of deriving macrofinancial regimes out of two uh, uh, basically axes. One is the scale of public spending that is directed towards um, green, uh, greening the economy and the degree of discipline that, that is exercised either by the, by the market or by the, uh, by the state in uh, reorganizing fundamentally structurally um, the, the, uh, the economy and the infrastructure. And I want to remind you that at least in, when we discuss decarbonization or when we discuss green transitions, we are, or there is very broad agreement that to have a significant decarbonization, you need to have very significant structural shifts in economic, in economic uh, production and in uh, infrastructures. So when we're, we're talking decarbonization, we're thinking very big changes, not, not very, big, uh, very big changes. So with these two, with a degree of discipline and the, degree, the scale of public spending, we are able to, to separate these uh, four regimes and so just to give you an example, carbon shock therapy is a high discipline, and this is a market discipline, a high, a high discipline, low uh, public spending regime in the sense that the, the state is not involved. The state doesn't do anything else besides either increasing carbon prices to levels that are significant to, to trigger capital reall uh, reallocations, or when you have an external shock, and this is also very important, when you have an external shock, the, the state doesn't react to protect its domestic sectors from the changes in relative carbon prices. And we also consider that to be uh, a form of market discipline because, uh, and I, I'm thinking, of, for example, of Germany in this year uh, with changes in, in for example, uh, energy uh, prices, uh, and the struggle, political struggles around providing more subsidies for uh, 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 German industries that uh, the Green Party has not won yet. So, we, or I'm thinking about I don't know uh, Egypt or Pakistan, where the IMF says you have to to remove fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, that to us is a form of carbon shock therapy in the sense that it subjects uh, uh, industries and consumers. Not so interested in consumers. I mean, of course, we are when it comes to questions of just transition, but mostly in industries where you get the carbon shock therapy when uh, the previous subsidies for fossil fuels that were helping one way or another, uh, your local industries are, are being removed. Um, so how do we how did we arrive at this um, weak and robust forms of de-risking? And it comes from two critiques that we heard of de-risking, and by we, I mean me and Ben, not just my, the royal me. Uh, one, one critique came from uh, a panel where me and Chirag uh, attended and, and several others and, and endless conversations on Twitter in the good old age when you can you could have conversations on Twitter and uh, Elon Musk showed them to you. And uh, where, so the, the research on the risking and the theorizing of, of, on the risking that I have done, so had done until the US Inflation Reduction Act Define the risking as making infrastructure assets investable, right? Which was mostly about financial assets. And uh, the debate that we had was well, can you talk about um, tax credits to um, uh, EV production, to electric vehicles product, uh, investment? Can you, can you describe this as de risking when it improves the manufacturing capacity, when it de risks uh, capital assets? And Josh Mason and several others. Uh, we're making an argument that maybe the risking and the idea of uh, it's not the right analytical framework to think about this. Maybe we need something else. It, it wasn't very clear to me what, what was this something else, but we, I, we wanted to take and or I wanted to take this this critique seriously. So we start we started to think well, how do we separate between this idea that somehow the state creates uh, alliances, partnerships with private financial capital to mobilize uh, uh, the trillions of asset managers into, let's say, um, schools, uh, to investments in schools or, if, uh, or social infrastructure or renewable, renewable energy and productivity enhancing, de-risking uh, uh, that is crowding in private capital in, um, in manufacturing sectors. And a way to think about that, and I just wanted to, to, to give you, I, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with the, uh, what does it mean to have investable infrastructure, but the idea is that you have to encourage 
uh, institutional investors who are sitting on trillions, and this comes from the, the World Bank and particularly the way in which the World Bank is and all the other multilateral development banks are rethinking development interventions as crowding in or ma maximizing private finance for development. And the idea is that you have to make infrastructure investable and you do it through public-private partnerships. For example, when you when you uh, the private sector builds a hospital and the, the state takes some risks from there, and that's where the risking comes from, through um, uh, power purchasing agreements where the state is buying or is guaranteeing a price or it's guaranteeing a quantity purchased from uh, private renewable uh, energy or through contracts for difference. I don't want to bore you a lot with it, but it's a form of guaranteeing a certain carbon price for a, uh, particularly for green hydrogen, but other um, uh, invest, uh, other types of um, energy sectors. So the idea is that somehow in this uh, arrangement, it is large asset managers like BlackRock that are in a sense the main partner for uh, the risking interventions. And we know because I, mean, I just wanted to show you there are many, many different types of numbers I could show you of why, why politically this has been a very appealing narrative because asset managers, including alternative asset managers like uh, private equity funds, are sitting on trillions which they would like to redirect into um, uh, infrastructure assets if the risk-adjusted returns are correct. And the argument is, well, we haven't done this, or their, their narrative, we haven't done this uh, investments because risks are too high or returns are too low, so the state has to come in and play a little bit with a risk return profile. And I, just, I wanted to show you an example of what that means. This is a Lake Turkana wind power project in Kenya, the largest um, uh, renewable energy project in, in Kenya, and I think the largest uh, wind energy project in, in on the African continent. And you will see here that all the risking involves both a multilateral official resources or public resources coming from multilateral development banks, coming from official development aid here, North Fund, uh, the Finnish Fund for Industrial Cooperation, and there is another one, the, the Danish one. This is all official development aid from Nordic countries. It is, in a sense, blended, and this is where the concept of blended finance comes from, With you'll see there uh, both private commercial institutions and multilateral development banks. And what they do, what, what these do is to give loans or uh, buy equity stakes at preferential rates into this private um, um, wind power project in order to make it more investable, in order to make it uh, the risk-adjusted returns for the investor that I've shown you here, for uh, uh, energy to kind of investments, mineral energy and sun pipe, or to make it more attractive for them to, to invest by adjusting um, uh, returns. And it, it's not, not only that, and of course, some of these have sold, some of the in, uh, initial equity investors have sold their share to BlackRock, uh, who is now, and I, we chose this example just because BlackRock is there, um, and BlackRock is now a significant partner in it. Um, but the Lake Turkana Wind Power Project also benefits from domestic fiscal resources. The, the Kenya Power and Lighting Company, which is an uh, offshore, I think it's a grid company, the state owned, uh, has entered the purchasing power agreement that says, I will buy this quantity at this price for the next X years. And this is a way of de-risking the investment because it guarantees a certain cash flow, right? There are many, many other examples, other examples like this, but the argument is, well, this is very different from, you know, when the uh, US Treasury, together with the US IRS says, well, we will uh, give tax credits, which is another form of the risking for me. Tax credits are, are, are basically a way of improving um, risk adjusted risk returns um, in order to improve um, or to, to stimulate to crowding capital uh, or to start as a crowding investment in manufacturing uh, sector. And how do we make sense of this? Well, we, we said we should think about it as a, different, a distinction between weak de risking and robust de risking. In the weak de risking regime, the, the, inter, the risking interventions, whether they're fiscal, monetary, or subsidies or guarantees or regulatory de risking, they do not have the aim of changing the, uh, the existing capital allocation and productive structure of the economy. They just aim to lower the carbon footprint of the existing um, productive structure. Right? This is why mostly it's about infrastructure, because it says, well, this is, uh, our, for example, our steel sector is 10% of the economy. I don't want to have less steel. I just want, I would like to uh, have the steel green its activity. So we are giving them uh, tax credits for green hydrogen in order to make 
steel production greener. Whereas in the robust de-risking state, the robust de-risking uh, in the robust de-risking regime, the state has an explicit preference for a, a, a certain capital allocation, for a certain productive structure, and it can come from a variety of reasons, but. Here, the policy target is now capital assets and the partnership that the state makes overtly is with industrial capital rather than with uh, financial capital. And there are many different ways in which, uh, many different instruments through which this can be done. You will see that for reasons that I don't know how much time I have. But, oh, okay, and I will, you can ask me about this. Uh, why tax credits are a specific kind of instrument of robust de-risking, whereas uh, PPPs or, or contracts for difference belong to the uh, a more uh, weak de-risking state. Uh, in Europe, most of most of the uh, uh, interventions are under what I would call a weak de-risking regime, particularly the reform of the electricity market that has been uh, very con very controversial. The new European Hydrogen Bank. And uh, the Net Zero Industrial Act, which is the form in which we think about, or, or the institutional mechanism for for industrial policy, as a for green industrial policy, as a response to the US IRA. Um, of course, the, the the beauty of the or in a sense the attractiveness of the robust uh, um, de risking regime is that fiscal resources uh, directed towards uh, de risking are much more significant, and in a sense decided by or set by. Uh, the private sector, the private sector in both the weak and the strong de-risking regime is in the driving seat and it, it decides the pace and um, a nature of um, investment and, and in a sense of decarbonization. Um, and this is why when, when we think about, okay, so what is the problem? Because I now I think my debates with the supporters of, uh, by the by the nomics and with the promoters of de-risking, particularly in the US, we have now agreed that we can describe this as de-risking, whether it's robust or weak, it doesn't matter. They say, oh, so what's the problem? Look at the vertical line, uh, it's fine, we should be happy with that. So we have started to think through why does it, why it is important to have the, um, discipline uh, within a, a, a regime of that aims or within a, uh, a policy that aims to profoundly and significantly transform the structures of, of your economy. And what we are arguing, and we're, we're drawing on this on the development state literature, because the development state literature is very clear that where the state has to change or take um, the economy into a particular direction, it needs to do so by, by uh, disciplining private capital. It needs to align private capital with its policy priorities. And here, this is a paper from uh, that I just published um, I don't know how many months ago with the Longo Sambasila, where we're looking at uh, green hydrogen in Namibia as an example of the risking uh, of a kind of incipient developmental state, a, re a renewal of the developmental state in green hydrogen in Namibia. And we are we've explored what does it mean to to have institutions that can can discipline private capital. And giving tax credits through the IRS and the IRS setting out a, a list of eligibility criteria is not, a, in, to my mind, these are not sticks. If we have, a, I, I don't like to talk about carrots and sticks, but this the, uh, the risking to me is, is mostly carrots. Remember, carrots are given to the institutions that kind of meet a, ser a set of criteria. These are not sticks. When we talk about sticks, you look at the developmental state. It means uh, state institutions and state capacity to monitor um, good performance, to reward good, perf good performance, and to punish poor, for poor performance according to your criteria. It's a much more demanding job, and the, the IRS is definitely not going to do it. And... Uh, in Europe, we don't have either. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not claiming that we're coming from a better uh, place, but we are not coming from. A, I, I, I'm going to finish in one second. So I there is a longer, but I didn't want. I, I didn't have time, 20 minutes to do this. There is a longer argument in the paper. It's online, so we can talk about it. Uh, where we argue that under this regime, unless we change. Um, uh, monetary dominance, the central banks can only be with the riskers. They are not climate policy makers. They cannot intervene in disciplining private capital. We give an example of the ECB trying to do that through the tilting of the corporate bond portfolio. Uh, it's impossible. And I'm going to finish with this. The fault lines that we see is basically that the risking as a, as a, a mechanism of, uh, of coordination, it, it doesn't work very well. There are very significant coordination failures. Because the assumption at the core of the risking is that the state just tinkers with price signals 
but the market mechanisms are much or, or the, the mechanisms that are driving price signals are far more sophisticated. So you can get into a situation as the wind producers are at the moment where uh, market mechanisms have, are in a sense overpowering the de-risking signal. And what you have left is, uh, you know, the market is shrinking, the new installed capacity in the wind sector is, is, is shrinking, so it, it doesn't really work. Then, of course, there is the distributional politics, and the distributional politics of weak de-risking is very clear. It is a de facto privatization, plus, you know, the, the privatization of public goods, because all social infrastructure that becomes investable basically means... Uh, you don't have free access to health. Uh, they, I mean, okay, I'm in a country where this is uh, not a uh, uh, not a shocking claim to make, but I come from a country country where we would like to not arrive at, at your state. So, um, <laughs> so the distributional politics is always the, the state is bribing private capital to offer uh, uh, public goods at much more uh, um, at much lower uh, accessibility rates. And finally, there is an unequal ecological exchange when we think about global north, global south dynamics, because robust de risking in particular is condemning uh, uh, countries in the global south, with a couple of exceptions, and we can discuss this, is condemning them to, bo to both be generators of financial yield for institutional investors, but also importers and of clean tech rather than producers of uh, clean tech. Uh, I will st stop with this and we can talk about the others uh, in the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Tanvir Akram, Citibank, um, and Tanvir will talk about China's current economic challenges, a perspective based on Fisher, Keynes, and Minsky. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, firstly, uh, the organizers, um, Open Society University Network, EDI, Levy, BART, for uh, organizing this. And I want to thank Pavlina for inviting me to this uh, uh, wonderful workshop. I'm going to talk about uh, China, uh, China's current economic conditions, and also to talk about some policy issues related to current economic conditions based on the perspective of Fisher, Keynes, Minsky, and also modern money as well. <laughs> Okay, so before I, I proceed, standard disclaimers, I'm speaking only from the views that I express I solely mine. So I'll start with the headlines. And uh, China, since the reopening, beginning of the economy, the recovery had slowed, but the economy is regaining, uh, is regaining traction. In the third quarter, um, uh, the growth was 4.9% uh, on a year ago basis and 1.3% not annualized. So, you know, growth is speaking up. And the pace of growth has been somewhat disappointing since the opening of the economy. There are some features of the uh, of the current conditions that suggest weakness in, in demand. Uh, unemployment rate, particularly <clears throat> youth un unemployment rate, had a surge to around over 20% um, in, in mid of this year. And since then, the authorities had stopped publishing it. Uh, presumably, on the ground, there are some uh, you know problems in the in the collection. Of the data, so that could be part of the reason. But also, you know, this is not a, a good number. Retail sales had also slowed uh, since the uh, in recent months, but they appear again just recently picking up, uh, picking up again. A growth in uh, uh, industrial production had also slowed, uh, but so showing some signs of uh, picking up. Uh, auto sales had had slowed during you know the COVID, and again picking up. Same with travel; those are picking up. Uh, inflationary pressures remain quite subdued, unlike the rest of the world, suggesting weakness of uh, effective demand as well as maybe there is excess capacity. Headline inflation was flat uh, uh, this uh, last month, um, and core inflation is also quite weak, below 1%. And core inflation has been less than 1% for more than a year. PPI has been declining for the past 12 months, again, suggesting that, which means that margins for producers are taking a hit, as well as weakness in, in demand. Um, nominal in the international trade side, uh, initially nominal export rose, uh, but you know, it's, it's been flat and actually declining in the current quarter, same with imports. The, in the real estate market, you know, that's quite important. There's ongoing uh, correction and authorities have taken measures to contain contagions. Um, the economy is, appears to be recovering, but the pace of recovery uh, will require you know, additional stimulus going forward, particularly if you want to address issues of, 
of the labor market, maybe some targeted policies to improve youth unemployment and overall to ensure our uh, uh, you know, labor market is close to full employment. Um, growth is likely to be around 5%, and, you know, and China will remain an important driver of, of global growth. Um, <clears throat> what are the risks? The risks are the slowing down of the you know, global economy is a clear downside risk. And of course, there are long-term challenges uh, for the transformation of the Chinese economy. Managing the relationship with the U.S. is definitely one of these issues, but also China's uh, goal of transforming itself into a modern, moderately prosperous country, that remains a structural challenge for the Chinese economy. So I'm going to uh, you know, ask some questions along this presentation, and hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll give an answer to these questions, not a definitive answer, but rather we can have a discussion on, on these issues. Will the authorities launch a fiscal stimulus? Um, will the PBOC, the central bank, ease monetary policy? Why has youth unemployment surged? What should be done? Uh, what can be done to stabilize the real estate sector? Uh, what will the effect of deflation on the Chinese economy? What type of reforms will uh, take place in the near future? And what is China's relation with the West? Will it deteriorate further? I don't have definitive answers to uh, these questions, but I'll try to you know, give an answer based on the review of the data and the perspective of the different economies that we will talk about. So this is the, shows the slowing of the Chinese economy. I'll go over the data pretty quickly because I've, I've talked about the slowing of the Chinese economy since the reopening. This shows that the slowdown of industrial production, but also some recovery that's taken place since then. Um, uh, real estate also uh, had, had slowed down after the uh, reopening of the economy, but also picking up, not as strong as before the COVID, but you know some signs of you know, consumer demand picking up this nominal uh, retail sales uh, growth. If you look at inflation, this is you know, clearly unlike the rest of the world, China is one of the major economies where there's, you know, inflation is quite low, particularly uh, uh, you know, headline inflation as well as core inflation quite. Um, PPI also, you know, also actually declining for more than a year. So uh, producers definitely there's excess capacity and that means margins for producers are taking a hit. Uh, you know, like I said, there's uh, you know, evidence of some improvement of the economy. Auto sales, China is the largest auto market, and electric vehicles are actually quite important. And also for US producers, China, you know, GM, Ford, China is one of the major markets. So auto sales have picked up. Um, travel, until very recently, travel had also picked up since the you know, shutdowns that took place, the dips that you should see, and the you know, lockdowns that occurred during the um, during the uh, 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 during COVID and thereafter, um, in the international uh, trade, also you know, recent months have been flat and uh, not uh, growing because of global weakness of global demand. Uh, unemployment rate, particularly for the youth, had surged. Many reasons for this. This one is, of course, the ongoing housing uh, correction. In that, uh, there was also some crackdowns on technology companies. There were also some changes in educational companies that used to hire a lot of tutors and so forth. And there is some skill mismatch, particularly during COVID. There was a, the authorities tried to you know, encourage young people to go to universities. And since then, you know, there's a skill mismatch. But of course, uh, going to university is a good thing in the sense that you, know, you improve human capital. Uh, but you know this is something that authorities will need to address going going forward. And maybe there is also weakness in the data. Often in the West, you know, any time there is some problem with Chinese statistics, so the authorities it's always blamed in China it is you know uh, providing misleading. Data. That may not be the case. There are weakness in the data, and there may be good reasons to improve survey methods. Um, <clears throat> real estate uh, correction. You hear about you know the ongoing correction. So there was a you know, very, you know, China had for many years very strong appreciation of house prices. And, you know, for the last year or so, a bit more than a year, there's been uh, adjustment of house prices. And this is an important topic. And if you look at the details of this, most of the correction is happening in the tier uh, two and tier three type of, uh, of cities, but there is a definitely ongoing real estate correction. Um, Authorities have responded with a number of uh, policies to uh, try to address um, you know, the ongoing correction, demand side policies, 
supply sides policies as well as restructuring measures. So despite you know quite a number of measures from relaxing um, taxes, rebates and income taxes, as well as some subsidy building of um, local government uh, uh, programs, also a number of the financing companies and real estate construction companies have put payments uh, problems in servicing their debt. Um, so there's been a lot of issues going around on that, and the authorities are trying to address that. Um, and, uh, during the past several years, household debt ratios increased. So private sector debt is also in, has been rising quite quite rapidly. Um, you know, since in the last uh, ten years or so, as well as non-financial corporate debt has risen markedly uh, in the past several years. Um, now, to take a perspective on you know the, the perils of debt deflation, and this is you know pretty standard actually. Fisher, uh, not all the economists that I'm going to talk are main in a, no, a non-mainstream economist. Fisher is very much a mainstream economist, but some of the lessons from Fisher was forgotten by even in the in the West and so forth. That you know, when there is a problem of debt deflation, uh, public uh, action is very important to be great to cure debt de uh, deflation and to reflate the economy. Fisher's view was that it's always possible if you have debt deflation to be able to reflate the economy back. That was, you know, one of the fundamental insights for Fisher that I think would be very important to think about policy issues for China as you face housing correction. Um, Keynes, I, I think the fundamental insight from Keynes that I, as I take it, is that, you know, and other um, others have talked about this before, is that an outstanding fault of the economic society in which we live, Keynes was of course talking in the 1930s, but it's still true today, uh, that we fail to provide full employment and arbitrary inequitable distribution of income and, uh, and wealth. Keynes is in mind capitalist economies, and even though China may not be a uh, full-fledged capitalist economy. It's you know it's definitely much more market-oriented and private property-owning economy than before. So I think a question of full employment and the inequitable distribution of wealth and income remains very important. Market economies tend to operate below uh, full employment definitely at certain times, and the operation of price mechanisms is not sufficient to get back to full employment. And that requires them for many different reasons, one of which is that investor behavior can be guided by animal spirit, which can turn into hurting, bubbles, crashes, panics, financial crisis, and so forth. And monetary policy uh, may not be sufficient to get back to full employment. So you need public action uh, to ensure full employment, socially necessary investment and improvement in the general living standards. So that, that would be insight from Keynes that would be very relevant to address China's problems. Uh, Minsky, Minsky, of course, you know, very familiar with this audience here is the uh, you know, financial instability hypothesis that over time, particularly after years of, of stability, uh, investors can shift from hedge financing to speculative financing, Swansea financing, financing, which can in turn create financial fragility for the economy, and that in turn can lead to financial crisis and serious economic downturn. Uh, and this, this requires the financial system to be well regulated um, and appropriate regulations need to evolve over time. And the financial system has to serve uh, the good of, of um, the citizenry. The, and in order to stabilize, there are two, you know, you need a central bank, which is with the objective of stabilizing the financial system, and a big government, federal government, with the objective of achieving full employment. I mean, of course, I mean, this is a cartoon version of, of Minsky, but there's a, a you know, more to it, but I you know, want to get to the essence of it. Finally, um, you know, many of our colleagues here have talked about job guarantee programs to achieve full employment. The central government of countries with monetary sovereignty do not have any operational constraint in serving their sovereign debt issued in their own currencies. Uh, China may not be fully monetary, monetary sovereignty, but it is a large, you know, uh, FX result. So, you know, I would say close to one, as Eric would uh, uh, talk about monetary sovereignty, not quite one, but definitely has the ability to, you know, uh, undertake and establish job guarantee programs where getting close to uh, full employment. And this is, of course, a think back, a very important part of, you know, universal declaration of 
of human rights. Everyone has the right to work, to free, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and to protect against unemployment. In socialist countries, you know, one of the goals of socialism uh, you know, is to get rid of the reserve army of the unemployed. Uh, so, they, of course, the implementation and design and details of job guarantees are important and should be based on institutional uh, realities and suitable for a, uh, that should be suitable for a country. Uh, what is the consensus growth and forecast? Uh, actually, for the near term, it's the consensus growth forecast is actually a bit lower than what the Chinese authorities are targeting, 4%, but you know, maybe a bit less than that. Uh, uh, CPI uh, forecast, you know, consensus forecast is below you know, 2% or definitely suggests weakness of, of, of demand. Um, so China, of course, besides the economics, there is you know, uh, tensions with Western nations on economic issues, international trade, intellectual property, exchange rate, technology access for Western countries, access to the Chinese market, geopolitical issues, Taiwan, Ukraine, Russia, South China, see is a security regime or what the West sees as the rules-based order where China emphasizes UN uh, security, you know, uh, international law as opposed to. And there are two Western views of China, and I'm contrasting the NATO view, and uh, I wanted to look for a more sanguine view. <laughs> the only thing that I could throw is Bertrand Russell in 1921. <laughs> the, the NATO view is that People's Republic of China stated ambition, coercive policies challenge our interests, security and values. The PRC seeks to control you know, technology, industrial sectors, critical, et etc. et cetera. I think a more sanguine view is Russell's view. The problem of China, transforming China into modern countries is a difficult one, and foreigners would have some patience while the Chinese are its <laughs> solutions. So I think, you know, Russell, 200 years ago, may have a deeper West than NATO. Um, all right, um, what are China's transformational challenges is to ensure regime stability and legitimacy, managing demographic transition, declining labor force and aging population, and uh, the achieving the goal of a moderately prosperous society, technological progress, productivity gains, innovation, and the emergence of Chinese companies as global leaders. <clears throat> okay, so try to answer you know the questions that I raised. Uh, so, what will the authorities do, or what should the authorities do? Will this require fiscal stimulus? Yes. Uh, will the PBOC uh, ease more? Monetary policy. They have done so already. Maybe we'll do so more. But as I, you know, I believe that it's not monetary policy that gets back to fiscal, you know, to full employment, but rather appropriate fiscal policy with employment programs. Uh, why has uh, unemployment, youth unemployment surge? Is weakness, excess supply, weakness of effective demand, skill mismatch. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, skill mismatch, a lack of hiring in technology companies, uh, and so forth. Um, what can be done to stabilize the real estate sector, reflate the economy, demand and supply side policy and restructuring? Um, what would be the effect of deflation? Not very good. I mean, you know, we need to address the problem of deflation. What type of uh, reforms? Not the ones that are advocated by IMF or the Washington or the Treasury Department, but what uh, the Chinese think is appropriate for modernization without ne neoliberal policies. Um, uh, what, will the China's relation with the West deteriorate further? Possibly, but what well, uh, could be or should be prevented? And that's up to you know, the choices that we make uh, in the US as well as uh, uh, the Chinese authorities make, but there are uh, serious risks of uh, deterioration. That's it. Yeah. So our next presenter is Chirag Lala, Center for Public Enterprise, and he will be discussing fiscal windows and administering um, capacity industrial policy after the IRA. All right. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Good. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a privilege to be here, especially after reading so many of the people who are, who are here for the last decade or so to be back uh, as a presenter is a, is a distinct honor. Let me make sure I'm pushing the right button. No, it's this, it's more remote. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, 
my, my technology skills are limited to what I do on my on my laptop. So, right. so no. This one? Is it going? It's not going. Let's try this. There we go. This one worked. Okay. <laughs> let's let's try let's try that again. Uh, okay. So what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, is a couple different things, but mostly I'm going to be providing an assessment of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, in particular, its tax credit provisions with an eye towards whether what's been done, the experience we've had over the last year can provide lessons for the future of uh, industrial policy. And also, of course, commenting on some of the pitfalls, both the ones that were evident in 2022 and the ones that are evident now. Uh, but I also want to parse some of the lessons for capital theory, in particular, how we uh, as heterodox economists understand how capital investment in particular uh, is undertaken because capital investment, I think we all understand. In fact, many in the mainstream, I hope we're starting to understand uh, is just going to be vital to many of the structural transformations we want to see, whether it be decarbonization or provisioning what we want to provision for our families, for workers and, and so on and so forth. So this is a this is a brief outline. I also have an appendix of slides at the end, just in case folks have questions that the main presentation uh, doesn't touch upon. Um, and the prelude I just want to offer is that a lot of what I will be talking about is actually applicable to both so-called private capital expenditure and public capital expenditure. And I will specify in the presentation if something I'm talking about applies to one or the other. And I just want to say that it, for a country like the United States uh, in the position that it found itself in pre-IRA, it is actually quite difficult uh, to get capital expenditure to increase and get capital expenditure to happen for a number of reasons that we uh, won't get into here. Um, and there were a lot of attempts to have that happen. But one thing that uh, was advocated during the COVID pandemic, specifically for, I think, transfer policies to support people's balance sheets during the crisis was actually uh, talked about by uh, Nathan in a, a in an early post of his when his uh, Substack was starting, is this idea of a fiscal window. I can't remember if you used the term, uh, Nathan, in that post. I don't, um, I don't think I used it. I don't, I don't think you did. I don't actually know the precise origin of the term, but it is this idea that the government uh, creates a facility that you can go to, and if you meet the specified criteria, whether it is that you yourself are a person meeting certain conditions or you have a project that meets certain conditions, that money is then dispersed to you for whatever the purpose you know, might, might be. Ideally, that window is uncapped so it can respond to whatever the conditions happen to, uh, happen to be, and ideally it is not uh, unduly time-limited. Uh, I was defined for COVID era transfers. And I think, you know, it, the concept was informed by some of the experiences with employment programs, particularly uh, India's uh, rural employment guarantee and the fact that it had to deal with annual appropriations. There's also some insight into this idea from just basic concepts of US federal budgeting, namely whether the, it's like annual and discretionary, whether it's indefinite and mandatory, how it deals with Congress's self-imposed fiscal rules and so forth. But the main definition of fiscal windows is as follows. And I want you to remember that because my argument is the Inflation Reduction Act tax credits, whether they are intended for private entities or for public entities, are a kind of fiscal window. They are uncapped but they are time limited. They're time limited over the course of a decade, which is enough time to get a significant amount of investment off the ground, but they are time limited nonetheless. They have preset conditions on them. I have a figure in my appendix with a list of the different tax credits in case anybody is curious about uh, specific provisions. And they are administered by the Internal Revenue Service whose lawyers do have some leeway uh, on specific provisions and how they are uh, interpreted. They are, there are also credits for both private actors and public actors. Most of them are for private, a lot of them are for, for both, but the ones that are for public actors fall under a provision that's known as elective pay. Previously, it was known as direct pay. Uh, IRS just sort of changed the name, um, but these are tax credits that can go to non-tax paying entities, nonprofits, state, city governments, tribal governments, um, and if they, you know, if they have a project that they own and operate uh, that meets the specified conditions of the credit, they can go to IRS and they will be given a disbursement uh, when that uh, credit goes online. And crucially, that credit goes directly to them in its full amount. They don't have to go through tax equity markets uh, to claim the value of the credit because, of course, they don't, they don't have tax liabilities. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, we don't have a good sense of what 
when you know when we are standing 10 years out what the final outlays on this spending will actually be and that's for any number of reasons but it, it's clear now that initial projections uh of ira spending you know vastly underballed what it could potentially be and part of this was because this was the congressional budget office doing some of these initial projections but it also became clear that the law's very passage and some of the hype around it generated potential users and so, you know, even private assessments of what final spending will ultimately be uh, dramatically increased. I can share this chart with folks in case uh, folks want to have it. And if I will also note, this is an active part of my research. So if folks know of particular pro projections that I haven't listed here, please, please send them to me. I'm trying to catalog uh, as many of them as, as I could find. But I mean, that raises the question, why aren't they higher, right? Why, why just stop at a trillion? What, what would it take to get them to three trillion, right? Uh, and and that's a that's a question I'm, I'm very much uh, very much interested in. and I think the answer lies in you know whether public or private why does capital investment happen and you know how can policymakers engage with that to make more of it happen in the desired areas uh, for our economy and I mean I my argument is very much that states in particular have a lot of agencies over the pathways of both private and public investment and that we should think of industrial policy because this is and I will note this is all happening in a, in a foregrounded conversation about whether industrial policy is back or not. Industrial policy should be thought of as the management, cultivation, nurturing, sometimes decommissioning of those investment pathways. Um, I'm going to kind of enter this conversation by giving a specific example of energy systems. This is just a very basic diagram of how you get from the generation in an energy system to the transmission system, to the local distribution system, to final end uses. And the point here is just to say that if you're gonna install clean generation at the beginning, you have to make sure that clean generation can go all the way through these steps to the end use in order for clean power consumption to actually happen. If you if you don't do that, all you've done is installed a bunch of metal and that's and that's about it, right? And so not only do you have to invest in the generating station, but you will probably face different investment needs all along uh, this transmission system. Um, this is incredibly stylized uh, and, and I will note this, but if you are an investor in what uh, industry regulation thinks of as grid resources, and uh, generation itself, storage or other kinds of ancillary services, you go through a pathway from planning out the capital expenditure at the beginning to ultimately putting it onto the system, reaping whatever the proceeds are, uh, managing your cash commitments, and then ultimately iterating with the grid, right? And this is a stylized look at some of those. And that includes everything from actual planning to working with financing or with governments to secure your financing, acquiring the materials, assessing the risks of what happens when you actually do plug a system in. And, you know, if anyone is curious, I can talk about any one of these steps. But the point I want to note is that there are uncertainties, unknowables, and risks, things you, you know, with a few heuristics might be able to try and quantify the probabilities of at every single stage uh, that is listed here, both in phase one and in phase two. And they can impact or halt investment anywhere in phase one. And if they happen anywhere in phase two on a project that is up and running, they can impact not only the future of that project, but the phases one and two of other projects down the, uh, down the line, right? So investment is very path dependent and self-referential uh, this way. This is a figure that uh, my organization, the Center for Public Enterprise created in one of our reports on elective pay for basically that precise pathway for public sector projects. And I can provide this figure or the report and a, a paired figure for private projects to anyone who is curious. But the idea of a pathway, and of course the Marxists in the room will be familiar with um, you know, MC, C prime, M prime, right? And this is a kind of more specific encapsulation of that for energy. I think it is worth it as just a methodological device to think of pathways for different sectors and, and goods and services when we're talking about uh, capital expenditure. I want to look at this graph just as a brief example of even when a project is in operation, there are things about the environment that it operates in that can impact whether or not it was ultimately considered a success and whether the future of similar such projects or projects that are looking at its history uh, to be effective. And so what this is, is this is a graph of solar generation in California. This is the famous uh, duck curve. Uh, and it's just the idea that like during the day, especially when we have a ton of solar, a lot of solar gets built onto the grid and you just don't have a lot of need for other resources, oftentimes not even wind, because there's just, if you have enough solar, so much of it will be produced that you don't need many other resources. The tricky bit 
for solar is in those spikes. First at the beginning of the day, second at the end of the day when solar rapidly ramps up, then ramps down, where you need other resources to facilitate the smooth operation of the grid. Why do I point to this when talking about capital theory and investment in solar generation? Because public and private developers of solar actively look at this and assess, oh my God, if we don't manage those two periods correctly, what is going to happen to my resource when I run it? In particular, will it be curtailed by the grid management authority? And will I just be left with a resource that can only either service my needs or just not function at all? And that is an active risk uh, that uh, solar developers consider. And a lot of it is out of their control, right? A lot of it has to do with other areas of investment, other grid resources, but it is something that affects both the present operation of solar resources and the assessment of future solar capital expenditures. This is just one example of, uh, of how the prevailing environment and prevailing path dependencies can impact capital investment. All right, and so uh, this is just a kind of summary of what I've said thus far, but there are plenty of these obstacles besides just the one example that I gave, right? Available demand for power, whether there is sufficient transmission and distribution infrastructure, are there contractors? to you know, hammer solar panels into the ground? Are there enough intermediate inputs and tools? And of course, we can all imagine some of the geopolitical implications of asking if those inputs and intermediate tools are available, various construction, legal policy, uncertainties, and so forth. I cite these to make the point that if those barriers are not addressed, investment either A, doesn't happen, or you get, and I will admit this is perhaps an imperfect uh, description of what goes on, but you get a variety a very undesirable distributional dynamics that result. This can be price spikes, large increases in markups, renegotiations of terms that private or public actors had previously entered into. For example, coming back and saying, I'm sorry, I just can't make my investment work at this price any longer, right? Uh, a failure of conditionalities that might've been put on industrial policy. Like for example, the provision of care services uh, if there's like a large, you know, I'm, I could say semiconductor plant, but I could also look at large energy generation systems and they could say, look, we don't have the money to service these conditionalities any longer. Delays, long, long delays, which is happening right now in with regard to renewable investment across the United States, bottleneck shortages. And then just, you know, you get a situation where actors then start responding to those delays and the actors with more power will in various ways win out in those distributional struggles. And then we'll, you know, we'll start to see a variety of uh, arguments about how particular industrial policy has failed and, and so forth. Um, and so my argument here is, you know, one of the reasons that the projections of IRA spending have a maximum or have the particular maximum that they do is that they could be even higher if particular barriers were addressed. And certainly if you address a number of them in a coordinated fashion, anticipated an actual investment will go up even higher, right? But the fact of the matter is the government created a fiscal window and now has a circumstance where the actual amount of the money that will pass through that window is entirely a function of just other policy matters uh, that have yet to be addressed and that the IRA in many cases just does not address. Right? Um, this is a summation of some of the macroeconomic heuristics that have been kind of implicit in the talk that I, I, I just gave to you. Uh, I've talked a little bit about uh, the capital, capital as a cyclical development process. One of the arguments I've been making more and more is that those barriers and particularly how they manifest as uncertainties and risks and how they shape what Jim Crotty would have called conventional expectations about investment provide us a much better tool for talking about comparing and conceptualizing different industrial policy tools than we have yet seen, right? Because you've seen a ton of these discussions about what constitutes industrial policy or not, or, you know, you know, mainstream economists just saying, oh my God, you know, industrial policy is here. That just means subsidization is back and everything is subsidization now, right? And, you know, to avoid some of those farcical comparisons, I would recommend using this as a basis for better comparison, right? But I would also say that again, for both public or private, we can use slightly different terms, facilitating capital investment requires, and this is where the terms uh, start to matter, creating those pathways for private entities that can mean creating profitable pathways, creating some kind of investability as uh, Daniela mentioned, or for public actors creating you know, actionable pathways, a pathway that a public entity can follow and meet its own legal obligations or its democratic obligations. Uh, and, you know, states have demonstrated, and particularly the U.S. federal government has demonstrated that they have the power to do that uh, in, in different ways. 
And you know, when I you know when I think about what socialization of investment might mean, I think we really are at a point where both increasing the amount of investment and then managing its downsides or managing you know, whether it is stable or not, that that is part of what socialization of investment can, can ultimately mean. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of those sub bullets as well, and if folks are curious. So we'll go to my final section. I have about, I think, five more minutes left. And what are the implications of this, of what I just described for administering capacity? Uh, pa Pavlina had asked when I do my talk that I talk about some of the implications of public procurement, and I will be getting into that uh, in, in this sector. And, I, and ultimately, my answer is, you know, the IRA created answers to some of the investability problems that existed in the United States, but those answers necessitate follow-ups, particularly because the IRA, I think very smartly and very thankfully, created a system where money will go out the door if we fix those other problems, right? Um, and so, again, encapsulation of this, and it is, for those of you who are curious, this is very much a political economy framework that, one, sees, you know, the capitalist block such as it is as something that can be checked, divided, worked within if a state has the creative impetus to do so. And you saw this with the passage of IRA, right? With the with particular elements of capital lining up behind it and particular elements of capital uh, opposing it. It also, and I have figures in my, in my appendix if folks are curious, separates out the macroeconomic management of demand and of capacity as two co-integrated, but ultimately separate elements of policy making. And I can talk more about that. And included in blue, I, I, I included just an answer, does IRA create a uh, uh, big green state? No, of course it does not, but it but it can lead to one and it does, I don't think it forecloses one uh, in, any meaning, in, in any meaningful sense. So I'll start by getting into the particulars of talking about the issues with elective pay. Remember elective pay is, it is the fiscal window for governments or nonprofits. There are several issues just within uh, getting elective pay correct, and I have a list of them, and I'll just talk about a couple of them here. One, there is a up to 15% penalty on the use of tax-exempt bonds, and state and local governments use a lot of uh, tax-exempt bonds. Doesn't mean they won't get money, but they will be penalized. They don't have access to the, benef to the benefits of accelerated depreciation that private users of tax credits have. They are, unlike private users, required to uh, domestically source some of their materials. Now, there may be good industrial policy reasons for that, but we're currently at a point where many communities, particularly some of our most vulnerable, are not in places where they can get those materials at any cheap price, right? Um, lots of states, cities, and tribal governments just don't have the staff or technical capacity to, to, to meet some of these. And there's still, and oh my God, there is still uncertainty around what some of the elective pay rules out are a year into the process of IRA. And this is just, I mean, I talk about uncertainties and risks, right? This is a human made, created uncertainty on investment that is still hindering uh, elective pay planning and usage because IRS is a year in, 14 months in, just not put out the rules yet. Right? And of course, a lot of the barriers that also apply to private development are also applicable in public development, right? particularly the availability of transmission and distribution and interconnection problems. So, you know, I, I work at Center for Public Enterprise, which focuses on promoting and facilitating and helping public ownership and operation of some of our key goods and goods and services, right? Right now, housing and energy, but we certainly wouldn't limit it to those two. And so I do have some recommendations for public energy procurement efforts across the United States, small or large. Right. And, and one of those is like a lot of agencies actually have the legal powers to pursue some of these things, but for a variety of reasons, don't use them or have like lost memory of them. So it, it is on us to kind of dig some of those out. Uh, whatever their relationship to Fed or Treasury. Right. And this is even in a future where those relationships become way more generous. Nurturing their own autonomous fiscal capacity is a political defense against future attack of, of, of almost any kind, of, right? And so if they can create a situation where they can nurture kind of their own independent revenue streams, they will be stronger. I would push, and a lot of this comes from the housing policy conversations that I've been uh, involved in and that Paul Williams, our executive director, has been involved in, you know, adjusting creatively to local political conditions is very possible as long as one keeps an eye on what the core functions of their particular industrial policies are supposed to be. And those core functions, by the way, should very much be related, as I mentioned earlier, to some of the investment barriers that I talked about. Um, and finally, I mean, learning by doing, I think, speaks for itself. But I, I just want to say about procurement, and I have one more slide on procurement. A lot of how they end up doing procurement of their materials or of labor uh, or of specific things that they need to buy things for cap from capital from involve structuring the procurement process that 
take some of capital's own tendencies and make them work for that public enterprise. So what do I mean by that? Um, these are just various examples of either how procurement can be done or uh, or how it can be structured and that, that can ultimately aid in price stabilization. So for example, if you have uh, a buyer or a dealer of last resort in key goods, if you have a buffer stock in key goods, if you see even uh, if you see a public enterprise that provides certain things like housing or energy grow over time, and you see a number of them, volumetrically, you can start to see a stabilization of investment in the areas that they deal with, and that can have knock-on effects on pricing, either in a region or nationally. And But also, you can have targeted and small-scale public procurement to target price stability in a particular area. So the example I give is... Uh, investing in a ton of public storage just specifically so you can deal with those periods morning and evening when renewable energy is having a lot of trouble, right? And you, you're not necessarily doing that just for like the democratic benefits of public ownership. You're doing it functionally to support a key problem that both private and public producers uh, are, are facing. And of course, I've already mentioned the design of public procurement policies to try if you have to deal with private capital to make it dance to your tune, if you, if you must, right? And all of these are in the service of stabilizing key prices, not just for inflation management, uh, but also because the more you have public ownership and operation, the more they will be subject to key prices. Right. This is an example of the duck curve. And so what that would amount to my last, uh, last example, this is battery dispatch in California, would just be even more storage available to kind of sharpen that 2023 curve uh, even lower. Now, I want to end, I, I know I'm a little over time, just by uh, a brief mention of the contemporary paradigms. There are lots of complementarities between what, between what MMT offers and the kind of framework uh, that I just put forward. Some of them are listed there. I want to give special mention to Isabella Weber's work on inflation, specifically in how it describes multiple path-dependent pathways that a particular shortage or bottleneck or issue can precipitate in from inflation, the importance of input-output li uh, linkages, and again, that a particular inflation path did not have to be the only one that materialized from a particular shortage, right? There's very much agency on the part of public operators where if they do the policy correctly, that the future inflation pathways are just different, and potentially easier, uh, easier to deal with. Alex Williams, who many of you know, has written a lot about the role of tight labor markets and also the physical capacity shortage view. Uh, of inflation, and I want to give special uh, emphasis on that uh, as well. I'm going to stop here. I have a slide. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to show the slide, but I won't get into it. If folks have questions, they can say it. So I have a slide on, I think, criticisms of recent uh, industrial policy paradigms. Uh, it's not a cr criticism of everything of, of Danielle's. There's a particular place where I think she and I have like uh, discussed quite a bit. We did on a previous webinar as well about if we're going to talk about, for example, the role of discipline. Uh, in uh, de-risking capital assets to be very clear about what that discipline is actually accomplishing vis-a-vis -vis increasing capital investment or not increasing. And I think that's one of our big differences, whereas I think we align quite a bit, certainly on our descriptive assessment of whether the IRA, uh, IRA constitutes a big, uh, big green state or not. And uh, I think in our dismay of some of the distributional dynamics, though I would very much emphasize that those are a product of certain things not being addressed. For those of you interested in public ownership and public advocacy, I would note that there is a slight and nuanced difference between too much of a focus on cost advantages that is reducing costs versus stabilizing costs, and to not assume that just because you have public ownership that certain capacities and tools to tackle those investment barriers will be built into public ownership. Some of the pitfalls of public ownership are that certain publicly owned enterprises were just not in a position to deal with or did not have certain barriers dealt with for them. And so do not assume the two. Very much go towards public ownership with a focus on what capacities uh, it needs to work. And of course, I can talk about these others as well, but I know I'm over time. Now, Q&A, please, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, we take three or four questions. Please. Okay. Out of China. Uh, you didn't mention at all um, the local government debt and the role of the local government in boosting growth. And then today, they have a tremendous uh, problem of debt and the proposal uh, that the uh, national government will substitute their debt in place. And what might that do? Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah. So, um, oh, I, I think we can take yeah. a couple of questions and then, yeah, please. Yeah, this is to Daniela. 
I'm just trying to understand this relationship between the development of the state and uh, your idea of a robust uh, deal with mm -hmm. uh, The reason I'm asking this is, you know, I'm first we don't have too many development in states. And if you look at the successful ones, if you leave out Singapore and Hong Kong, which are city states, really, you have only two countries which made the transition from being backwards to being developed, which is South Korea and Taiwan. And those who look at the South Korean experience basically say that the notion of discipline there was the ability of the state, which was offering a huge host of concessions, including differential interest rates, guarantees for borrowing from abroad, etc., was its ability to be able to enforce compliance without instruments. I mean, most developing countries, like say India, Brazil, they, they actually had physical controls and price controls operated, whereas here you had enforced compliance. It was a kind of relationship between state and capital, facilitated, of course, by the advantage of a close relationship with the United States. Now, if that be the case, what we are saying is that what you're calling the enforcement of discipline is something which is the consequence of having a particular kind of state. And you know, there was a vacuum in, in South Korea. The land of the capitals were Japanese, they had to leave out an American occupation. So you had a particular kind of state which could enforce compliance. So supposing we don't have that, that history, then are you trying to say, I mean, are you suggesting that in a market economy, we really cannot have industrial policy of some kind because that would actually end up just providing uh, concessions to private capital. And Danielle, when you answer that, I'd also like to like to provide an answer to one more question. I mean, just to elaborate on on that point, because you know the takeaway is that even these robust uh, jurisking. Um, Paradigms have these coordinating problems. They have difficulty with disciplining capital. So, I mean, one of the one of the questions I had was, well, what are the benefits, pros, and cons of outright guarantees versus de-risking? But then the other one was, how about just um, building parallel structures, you know, along the lines of public investment? To what degree that is a more viable model for more robust transformation and investment? Considering all the pitfalls in the way we structure public finance and how we prioritize private finance and these auxiliary support structures that we need, is this a more viable pathway for a transition if we have these difficulties with coordination and discipline? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Randy, for raising that important point. Yes, so I did not talk about <laughs> local uh, government debt and local government funding vehicles, as, as well as state-owned uh, enterprises debt and so forth. Um, so that's obviously a very important part and, uh, of the story there, as well as the fact that local government had often depended on a land and land-related uh, uh, investment and activities for its revenue. So resolving that, I think, will require you know, some changes in the relationship between the, uh, uh, the provincial, municipal authorities and the central government and reforming the relationship with that. And probably will require the central government to take most of the, first of all, devise what is the appropriate relationship. And most of the, you know, because of uh, the, the central government has the more ability to uh, issue debt and you know, take on these activities. But that's a decision that the, 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 uh, the, the Communist Party or the rulers in China will have to make going forward. But that's definitely the important part of the uh, you know, policy options and changing the uh, policies. Also, the data on local government, that there are issues in the collection and the appropriate uh, quality of the data on that. But this is definitely an important issue going forward uh, and something that, you know, that, that should be discussed in policy using the framework of the games and, and, and modern money. Um, thank you, Chandra. Very clever question. You threw me off a bit. No, I would say um, so. The argument that we are we are making in the paper is that to have the kind of structural transformation that decarbonization requires, which is much broader than just green industrial policy, you have to be able to discipline private capital because you also have to shrink some sectors, right? And you have to shrink some sectors that are fossil intensive. And we give examples of shrink. The attempts that the European Central Bank has had to shrink some sectors, but that were very quickly rolled back because of the politics of it. It's just not sustainable. It's so overtly credit policy and so inconsistent with central bank independence that, that it was rolled back. But so that's one thing. The other thing is that maybe you and I have a different understanding of 
what South Korea did uh, in to become a successful, you know, to have a, a successful uh, upgrading. Because I, if I remember Alice Amsden's uh, book well and, and her argument around discipline, of course, she what she argues there was that there were price controls that the, the the South Korean government, of course, with the whole geopolitics behind of, of U.S. support behind it, but also with a strong technocracy, uh, and even with the kind of links that we between the state and private capital that we would now describe as vested interests, the Korean state had mechanisms for long term. Uh, uh, discipline or for long term reward of good performers and long term uh, pe pe penalties on on poor performance uh, on poor performance and and that included even uh, corporations that were close to the government right close to the authoritarian government at the time so I'm not sure that I would characterize the South Korean developmental state in the way that you have. But maybe this is a conversation that we have to take further. I need to think about it more carefully. I would say that we do have, I mean, I, I didn't talk about China because we have a, a China person here. I think China is a very good example of successful uh, clean tech industrial policy. I mean, that is very, very clear to me. I think it involves at least, and, and I, I didn't elaborate a lot on it, but what we know from Alex Samsden's work and the developmental state work is that the state has to use the institutions, the, the finance and credit flows as a means to somehow, if not discipline, at least, you know, as, as a stick for, for, for private manufacturing capital. And what you don't have in either the weak or the robust de risking uh, kind of configurations is finance is not a stick. Finance is something that you need to also kind of separately write one way or another. And I didn't have time to elaborate here, but... But if we actually appeal what is behind the IRA, a lot of it is private equity or banks fighting over tax credit. And Jennifer can give you a much better account of this than I can. Banks fighting over tax credit with Basel three requirements. So even that separation that we make between industrial capital and, and financial capital is not so clear cut for, for a variety of reasons. And I just want to know that, that, I just want to extend this, this agreement. I don't think that most of what Chirac has described in is what I would describe as industrial, or what has been analyzing is I would describe an industrial policy, creating the conditions for infrastructure investment, you know, for, for solar plants is not the same as creating the conditions to manufacture solar panels. And you discussed, most of the, your discussion was around what does it take for a new wind, wind farm or a new solar plant to occur as opposed to, as opposed to the Chinese state doesn't say, just how do I increase my renewable energy share in the overall energy composition? It's saying, how do I increase my market shares of solar panels exported, of wind panels exported, of batteries exported? That to me is the question of industrial policy, you know? Getting your infrastructure, that to me is weak, weak risking and we can agree or disagree. Um, and for Paulina, Paulina, I don't know what you mean by, by the difference between, between outright guarantees and de-risking. Well, what, what are, because to me guarantees are de-risking as well. Well, uh, one is finding the right price, creating the conditions to induce the investment. The other one is guaranteeing the profit, guaranteeing some of the costs and saying, yeah. okay, just build this dump. Uh, okay. And whether the, well, I mean, there's always a private public partnership, mm -hmm. uh, which is always involved, but we could pursue mm -hmm. these other public nonprofit strategies. Is this a viable pathway to circumvent mm -hmm. some of these problems with finding the right conditions to induce the investment. Yeah, I, I would say that where what Jira and I align like closely is in our, our shared desire to see at least the, a lot of renewable infrastructure owned or tried directly by the state because the, the, the market conditions and the changing market um, pressures in uh, in the in the private energy sector or and the problems with the grid behind it. I mean it's just there are so many layers of 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 added, of added complexity that the market cannot resolve this problem. And, and in the end, what the risking assumes is that somehow with the right amount of, of state guarantees, subsidies, tax credits, whatever you want, loans, et cetera, somehow you can, the, the market will get there without you having to outright own uh, things. And so we, I, I don't think the, the description of most of the of the staff of, of the most of the institutional architecture that China was talking about outside of the state sector, I don't think it, it creates the conditions for for ensuring that capital, the private capital, stays on the course that the state needs it to needs it to stay. So if you look at the debate around the wind sector, what you see is that private capital comes back and does what 
the Commonwealth uh, colleagues call green capital strike. In other words, it's said, well, you know what, my profits have changed. Would you like to give me higher prices now? I mean, and if we continue like this, you know, it's just a constant bribe. And, and in the end, to me, this is a fiscal issue because it crowds out or, or it consumes more and more of the fiscal resources. And if you look at the examples of, of uh, for example, for uh, Ghana or Nigeria, we are talking very serious money poured into the risking to guarantee not a certain level of profit, but to guarantee a certain level of demand that is already inscribed in, in, in contracts, which then are only revised, these contracts are only revised to improve returns for, for private capital, but never never to reduce returns for, for private capital. Okay, sorry, I'll stop. Yeah. yeah, so actually I want to address um, both a couple of things Danielle said, but I think that it's sort of tied together. So I, I want to start with discipline and I will give, I think, a US focused example on why I think the way discipline is cast as an a priori policy imposition might be a little problematic, which is a lot of US climate policy, such as it was actually started out in what we might think of as an a priori disciplinary or to use another term sticks kind of policy, right, which was state climate targets and plans saying, you know, by 2025, 2030, we will hit this amount. And if we don't, there will be penalties, right? And, you know, you better start investing accordingly, because if you don't, your costs will go up. And, you know, there there is your inducement to invest. So what penalties? If, if you see by 2030, it's, I will do something to you. That's not the penalty. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a, it's a threat to some to some to some of them. The idea being that, like, look, your your cost flows are going to be terrible if you if you don't do this. So, like, get you know get moving. That was climate policy in the U.S. for a long time, and at the state level, it's still in many cases the primary thing states consider they have to do. Previously, it was in lieu of any spending, but now it's as a complement to the IRA. This famous idea of what was it standard sticks uh, and then spending, right? Like standards and sticks are still a large part of state level uh, climate policy, and the problem is without some component of spending, getting that capital expenditure was really difficult. And in fact, California, which the example I gave, you know, pioneered a lot of this stuff. But one of the things that helped California build up a lot of solar pre-IRA was the fact that its net metering was extremely generous if you actually did build the solar. And that is, you know, we could conceptualize that as a carrot. I also don't do uh, carrots and sticks very much. Um, I, when I think of discipline and I, when I think of effective discipline, I am much more likely to think of discipline as a description of an ex post outcome that some combination of policies uh, kind of ended up uh, ended up producing, right? And so you can think of, for example, um, if you think of uh, macroeconomic policy that makes you know that increases aggregate demand and then that aggregate demand that induces some capital expenditure, that is a pushback on either elements within a firm or in relations between firms and their investors that might have called for you know disgorging that cash quote unquote, but then you have elements in the firm that won out and said, okay, we will do capital expenditure now because there is demand for our products, right? You could, in that case, you could say a kind of discipline on elements of capital happened, but it was as a consequence of a policy measure we took and not as a, a kind of a priori, you know, impos imposition on capital. Uh, the other thing I want to note about um, the- the yeah, that, that outcome might not get realized. I mean, you're saying that it's, it's just happenstance that you, you get disciplined. Mm. I mean, I think I, I think the, the discipline is, is is as a description of like if if private capital wasn't undertaking something and there were elements within it that weren't undertaking it, you know, to the extent that we can think about like decision making within private capital, you have to do certain things to push that decision making in a certain direction. But I mean, you're right. It's it's a it's a it's a description. It's not it's not something that was done before to say you know we will use a quote unquote stick. Uh, to force you into this but, result. But, but, this but, is... but the Korean state, I mean, the, in the developmental literature, there is a, a conceptual lens that describes what disciplining institutions mean, how they operate, how they force private capital to go into a certain direction. There. So then, then you're saying this is not relevant. I'm just going, if, if somehow we get where the state wanted to get, it means that there was this discipline. Uh, but I think, as was mentioned, some of those elements existed in import substitution regimes as well. And I mean, there is also an extreme, I mean, a very well-known element in the developmental literature that focuses on the principal role of those export markets in providing the uh, in providing the demand. And there is a liter and there is an element of the literature that says that that was a key problem, for example, with with the Indian regime. Now, whether that is the fault of the Indian state itself or not is subject to debate. Right, of course, and we can we can wonder about whether or not that is their fault and and and, and all the rest of it. But I mean, it, it happened, right? Um, and so in that case, it is it is the demand, in this case, from an external party that may well have been facilitating some of those investments. I would not pretend to enter into the debate about the specific efficacies of certain measures of the South Korean regime, but I am aware of that of that principal role of demand. And of course, demand was the domestic example I used uh, right before. I, oh, 
I'm sorry. Give me a chance to sure. the audience uh, to ask some more questions and then uh, discuss during the dinner further. <laughs> so, yes, please. Hi. Um, I know we all hate talking about carrots and sticks, and it feels um, ill defined metaphor for doing it, but nonetheless, even though we say that, nonetheless, we still use the term. So clearly there's something about it that we want to talk about. And I want to push on this carrots and sticks thing, not in a whole, but on a particular thing, which is when we're conceptualizing a carrot and a stick, what's, you know, I want to open the black box of the carrot. Uh, and specifically the thing that, uh, that has always struck me, that, that struck me in this conversation as I really kind of focused in on it is, is being threatened to being fired from your job, is that a stick or is it part of the carrot? Is it the string that the carrot's attached to? Because, you know, well, one lamp, you know, I, I, I talk to most people, the threat of getting fired, I think they immediately instinct would be go stick. But if, but on the other hand, if instead we think, well, it's not actually, it's not a uh, form of discipline or something that's coming out of nowhere, it's it's a conditional thing. You're not going to continue really receiving your salary unless you maintain this kind of performance. You can think about that as whether you're not going to get paid or not, whether or not you're going to get more tax credits or not, or whether or not you're going to get, um, or whether you're going to get tax credits clawed back from you. And so I think um, some, not all of the conversation, for example, shrinking sectors that we think should be shrunk, um, this doesn't really get at, but I think opening that black box kind of had a lot of the disagreement about sufficiency of carrots versus, carrots versus sticks comes about that conceptualization of basically that employment metaphor. Uh, if I could actually, uh, if we have just a couple of more sure. questions. Then oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, so Daniela, you um, concluded by noting that these strategies of de-risking amount to defer to privatization of public goods. So I want to um, address two questions to that. One will come from typical right, and then the typical left, and see how you respond. Public goods. But what so uh, a, a, a right wing actor? Mm -hmm. Prince Michael of Monaco once remarked. Um, well, businesses, yes, do that because we need um, the state just to let us do what we, uh, what, what we do best, but also give us full support. And this is just typically justified because there is an overarching public interest to obtain either competitiveness, national competitiveness, the global economy, but in our case, the green transition. So there's an overarching public interest to do it this way. Mm. That's a typical uh, right-wing um, answer to your concern with the uh, defective privatization of public goods. The left-wing uh, obvious answer is, well, how about um, MMT and, in fact, do full scale public investments in building the green economy as a public good. So, would you go with that? And one more question? You want to talk with? Yeah. yeah, you want to? Ask? Oh, yeah, I had, a, I had a question that was like um, directed at Daniela and like a broader political question because I was wondering. What would you see as the main reason that the, the European response, or if you call it response to the IRA, is falls much more under the scope of the weaker de-risking? What, what are the reasons for that? And one last question, or if they have any other question here. Uh, <clears throat> so my question is, in these discussions about uh, industrial policy or de-risking, it's kind of a two or three actor model. There's the state, there's uh, industrial capital and maybe also finance capital. Uh, what is the role for labor? You integrate that fully and give full reign to carrots and sticks and strategic considerations. Um, so I, I'm in a position to answer two of the questions, I believe. So it's Nathan's and part, partial answer to yours. So uh, Nathan, I, 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 I agree. I mean, depending on how you conceptualize both the terms, but also the policy detail, 
you start to wonder, is this a characteristic? And I mean, I'll use the tax credits just as, just as an example. Private tax credit, public tax credit, either way, the government is taking over a significant portion of the capital stack. Depending on the credit terms, it could be as high as 50% in certain cases uh, for either private or for, for public. By, by taking over, you mean subsidizing? By, 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 by meaning, like, so for example, with the investment tax credit, it says if you meet certain conditions, whatever your investment bill is, the government, the federal government will pay 50% okay. of it after a certain point, right? That is a straight up like that's, we will do it if, if that happens. On the other hand, in order to disperse that money, so you could do everything necessary, but if you don't get the project operational or something about the project is wrong or it ends up being a partially emitting project, <laughs> if you get to that point, the government won't disperse the money, right? So was it, depending on how the terms of the credit were structured, is the credit a character stick? I mean, you, you start to see some of the issue with character stick, and that's why I try my best to shy away from it. But of course, you know, it, it is common parlance that it, it is used. Um, on the role of labor in particular, so I, I will give the example of the state of Vermont, where uh, where I live and do do a lot of a lot of my work. Um, no matter whether you are setting up a public entity to own and operate certain things, or whether you are doing investment to manufacture, or if it's investment to just set up certain kinds of systems, labor shows up again and again and again. As I think. Uh, uh, Professor Ray, you said in, in your talk, socially necessary labor, right? We, we need contractors to do a variety of things in order to get these systems up and running. We, we need people to staff these systems. We need people to operate them. We need people to check them to make sure they aren't decaying over time, right? And it's just, labor is a pivotal, pivotal piece of, 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 of this. And, you know, whether we are giving labor what it needs in order to do these activities or not also shows up again and again, especially in conversations where labor representatives are involved, right? You, you will notice in discussions when labor representatives are involved is they will be the first ones to talk about, you know, well, you're telling us to do these things, but you haven't actually, you know, given us the software we need, or you completely neglected that if we plug in this system here, that power line over there will fray, right? So labor has expertise and things that it can, it can uh, bring to the table. So like, you know, the cultivation of particular skills, the necessary payment to labor to ensure that it does what it what it needs to do. Uh, you know, all all of these issues show up in in industrial policy as both not just as a crucial input, but just as crucial beneficiaries uh, of, the, of these systems. I think there is a there is a debate which I don't think your question was necessarily touching on, but that does happen about whether certain beneficial policies for labor should be paired with industrial policy, that sort of farcical debate from the New York Times about like everything bagels and, and, and not. And I think my, I would, I would note that like there is no contradiction between having beneficial things for labor, whether it be higher wages or particular packages in industrial policy. The question always becomes, how are you integrating that administration with the particular policy design for addressing certain barriers? And the, the, I phrased this in a question, someone asked me once of like, you know, you can design the most heavily contingent IRA program, but it will be no substitute for the PRO Act passing, or it will be no substitute for like effective sectoral bargaining. If you try and like put everything together and then you don't have, for example, those other vital policies. And so industrial policy, of course, in the division of labor of various policies needs, you know, labor policy to do its thing as well. And we all suffer when it doesn't. Uh, okay, thank you for your questions and Nathan. Mm -hmm. Provocative, I would say that under capitalism, the class war is always uh, just sticks from capital to labor. And I will leave it at that. When we talk about the relationship between the state and capital, it's a very different story. Mm -hmm. And to me, tax credits are probably the least uh, effective way of, of, of putting together or, or starting to, to create the building blocks for disciplining mechanisms. I still don't really see how you can claw back tax credits after the company has already set up the the EV manufacturing plant. I mean, I think the opposite has happened every time the, uh, Elon Musk got tax credits to do things that he never did. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm still confused about how tax credits could become a stick in what sense. I, I see it as a fully as a, as a carrot. I think effectiveness is different than otherwise. You can have an ineffective stick. I know we are, I, we are not disagreeing that, yeah. that, that the state has been very, 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 very ineffective at disciplining private capital for a variety of reasons that Fred Block in 1979 described very well. I'm not saying here that I'm proposing some political miracle that will only happen if politicians got, the, got their act together. I think, uh, thank you for your question. I would say, it. yes, um, and I, hope, I hope my MMT friends will study decarbonization a lot more and, and, and do use the MMT angle towards decarbonization. 
precisely because and I did spend a lot of time with this audience, but in, in other audiences, I make it very clear that the, the macro, macro financial justification for the risking is there is not enough fiscal resources. The state has run out of fiscal space. We need to mobilize private capital because we can't do direct public investment. This is the, the, the narrative that you get. So, of course, then the right wing uh, uh, story comes in and says, oh, we have the capital. We have the trillions uh, under management. We just, there is a market failure. This is how the right narrates it now. There is a market failure which basically doesn't create the, uh, the right risk returns for us to invest in renewable energy, for us to invest more in, in schools, for us to invest in, I don't know, nature, biodiversity, everything under the sun can become an asset class. So the idea is the state has to help us, like it's helped us, uh, helped us in the past, but it wants, and to me, this is a very perverse, it's a, it, in itself, it's a perversion of the logic of the market itself, because basically the state is, is helping one actor and destroying the, the the conditions for competition. If you're if you're giving if you're Nigeria and you're giving a particular comp, a renewable energy company, you're giving them a, a a particular price for their product, and market conditions change. You're you're on the hook uh, for for that and allowing them to make excessive profits when you shouldn't be. So it's it's kind of anti-competitive in itself. I, this is what I would say to my right wing friends who 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 like the risking on on the on how about MMT. Well, I think this is something that I'm hoping I will learn by the end of, of tomorrow, <laughs> uh, which is when interest rates are rising, and uh, uh, I don't want to say that is MMT uh, a low interest rate political phenomenon, uh, or or does it have political purchase when we're at the zero zero bound? But can we tell can we tell the same story uh, with an MMT uh, angle? of how the state basically can create the conditions under under which it takes a lot of the decarbonization fight on its balance sheet directly. Uh, and, and I think it, it's a difficult political story to tell. I don't think it's very easy to tell it, but my, my this is my sense uh, for, for a variety of reasons. And I just want to know, I mean, we discussed demonetization here earlier. I just want to know that almost every central, the Bank of Japan has, has talked basically targeting the yield curve. We are, the political winds are blowing into the, very much into the other direction. Um, and finally, why why is the European de-risking state weaker? And I because in 25 minutes we cannot do very much. But in what are we are, do we do in the paper is to say that in the end there is a continuum between a, a weak and robust de-risking that is set by the macro financial status quo, so under monetary dominance until you have like a like an MMT kind of change in not in only the mechanics of the relationship between the central bank and the treasury, but also in the politics of that change. Uh, so on this spectrum between weak and, and robust de-risking, what matters where you are is the, the relative strength of fiscal and, and geopolitical hawks. So where geopolitical hawks are stronger, they can pull like they put in the US in the direction of some robust uh, subsidies for private capital investment in strategic sectors. We we don't have in, in, in the European, in the Eurozone for many different reasons, fiscal hawks are much stronger because the politics of the Euro area really doesn't allow for anything else unless lots of things change. So I'm saying this is where politics comes in full front to say the risking is ultimately a question of, of, of political coalitions. The role for labor, we don't, I don't, the, I don't have a theory for, uh, of what labor is doing in the risking because this is specifically about the relationship between state and capital. But what I will say that I, I took courage from and I have to think through is somehow robust risking is creating conditions for uh, labor to demand a higher share of, of or, or or to fight the distributional fight, uh, bat, battle with 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 more success. If you look at the the strike in the in the auto sector, so I don't know how to think about this yet, but I think it's important. Yeah, if I may, add, so one uh, two issues I think first actually uh, related to the issue that uh, uh, Randy pointed out, and something that I did not mention. So I think one important issue in China, particularly, is the transfer of you know, resources and tax between the central and the, uh, and the uh, provincial and local governments. So that's also an important issue there. Not just the debt, but also the transfer of revenue, sharing and tax rates. One. And secondly, on related to interest rates and in business investment, uh, in particular, you know, I mean, this is, I mean, we, the mainstream kind of theory or textbook is that interest rate has a big uh, impact on, on uh, business fixed in investment. That's what we have taught in Blanchard and Fisher and so forth. But even by the empirical research on this, but by, by, you know, mainstream economists, 
is that the relationship is very weak if there is at all effect, demand and growth and economic activity in general has much more impact to the, on, on business fixed investments. So that's on the uh, you know, low interest rate might be desirable, but that's not really the main driver of, of uh, business investment. Many other things are far more important. Are there any other questions? Yeah, please. Yes, there are a couple more. We have a couple more minutes. Well, it's more of a comment. I guess I'm thinking there's a talk on China, and then there are other talks where we're debating can the state have a role in the development of the economy where China, right? Like, it's, how can you look at China and not like say, well, the state can have a role? Money is not a constraint, and if there is a will, there is a way. I, I'm sorry, I just had to point out. Eva, if I may add, not only in China, but even if you look at the US history, I mean, it, it's very clear that. You know the federal government and the government for the agriculture to modern uh, aircraft or the defense the u.s defense industry is very important part of the industrial policy no, no but we, i i think we have to maintain some conceptual you know boundaries here and saying whether china is a big green state to me is different than saying the u.s has a large uh, fiscal outlays for for its you know maintaining its hegemonic position in the international economy um, <laughs> Just, just two uh, thoughts. So, so one is, um, uh, I've been trying to get, there, there's actually a, quite a robust, in the Eurozone, a robust climate movement, very active in many countries and quite well coordinated. And I've been trying to interest them in MMT and getting the ECB, Christine Lagarde, you know, says that she's interested in climate and so forth and so on, and trying to get, uh, and I think that, to get the state, we need the state really designed. So in other words, the, the big, it, it, we're putting this under big green state. So sorry, it's not to be risking, mm -hmm. but- um, No, don't be sorry, I'm against you. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, but, but we need, we need this design, the state to, to be designing and to be daily least and so forth and so on to do these things. Because just leave, as you say, leaving it to the private sector is not going to happen. Also, some of these private sector actors are also fossil fuel companies, so they have a uh, they don't have a commitment uh, entirely in terms of their entire portfolio to um, you know uh, renewable energy. Um, and, and also, just a, a very quick question for Sean. Um, I saw that the IR the estimates for the R IRA investment were astronomically higher for uh, Goldman Sachs and uh, Credit Suisse versus the uh, the public entities. So just I, I just didn't know if you had any thoughts about how that why that is. I I, I don't. I think I, I think some of that is just attributable. I think to uh, particular like fiscal conventions that some of the public entities may be following. I mean CBO comes to mind uh, okay. in, in in particular, but I don't have a strong take one way or the other. I will note that it's unclear to me. The composition of those investment uh, of those investment figures, for example, Credit Suisse noted the impact of elective pay, but I think balked at being more specific on how much of that or if any of that was was elective pay as well. So, can I just add something to what, or, or do you want to ask one more question? One uh, last uh, question. Yeah, okay, sure. to sort of clarify questions. You give the example of de risking and uh, Black or essentially investing in the Kenya project. Um, so, based on based on how I look at de risking, and if you look at a lot of the um, power independent power plants that were set up in the sort of late 90s and the early 2000s, there was a sort of dollar component to them as well, where a lot of developing economies were forced to pay dollar returns. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the de-risking process, a, I'm not sure if if governments perhaps even had the fiscal space to do it, because a, we're talking about a foreign currency in the de-risking process, so I think that that's, a, that's some sort of a concern that needs to be highlighted. Mm -hmm. That one. And the second is, um, if you look at a lot of Typical private equity funds. So if you if you have the conversation that private capital can come in, you look at typical private equity funds, they have a fund mandate of about 10 years, and five years is the first investing period, the remaining five years are divesting. So in, in that sort of a case, um, what we've seen in Europe is that there's some sort of legislation happening as well, where there's there are European long-term investment funds that are gaining a lot of traction as well, and BlackRock has a European long-term investment fund as well. And they're they're looking at you know, pension funds or direct contribution schemes to essentially invest in a lot of these um, infrastructure projects. So the question is, 
when we when we say there's a lot of private capital, yeah, I'm not really sure if there is a lot of private capital because the typical private equity fund doesn't really have the money to do it. They're not even, even looking at those investment avenues to make those investments. They're trying to create a new fund structure to do it, which frankly the past sort of five or six years hasn't really gained traction. And there were this sort of new regulation that the European Parliament actually undertook, which might gain more track, which might result in greater traction, but we haven't really seen that. So just kind of those sort of two, two clarifying questions are next. Okay. okay, so very quickly, I, I, we, I don't disagree. And in the, in the paper with Ndongo, where we look at um, uh, Namibia's green hydrogen project, we make it very clear that there are specific, you know, uh, a, both financial and technological dependencies and constraints. That means you, you do have to have significant at least access to dollar reserves in order to be able to import the technology. But how do you organize then the 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 green hydrogen project or how do you organize in general uh, your your investments in your strategic sector don't necessarily have to go through the risky maybe and i will i will i would probably reluctantly concede this that there are green commodities where you should probably do the risking but just make sure that the state gets significant dollar revenues that it can then deploy for in green industrial policy elsewhere so i'm i'm, I'm not a purist in that sense i i accept that uh, whether there is a lot of private capital or not that, that can do the risking, I think, is a, is a matter of, of political narrative, uh, precisely because, you know, the argument is, are risk-adjusted returns high enough and how much do we need to, to put them up? And it's not only a question of the, the term of the, of the investment, but also, I would say, just outright uh, risk returns. To your question, the ECB, so I, I didn't have time to go through it now because uh, the... Um, of time constraints, but what we show in the paper is the ECB before the inflationary pressures that pushed Lagarde away from climate. What it had done is to put in place exactly the institutional mechanisms for disciplining, because it's a program to do uh, to green its corporate bond portfolio. The ECB has corporate bonds that is purchased under unconventional monetary policies. What it, what it what it did to do is to say, I'm going to tilt my, the corporate bond portfolio through reinvestments only, it could have been more, more ambitious, but I'm going to tear them away from dirty companies towards green companies. And to do that, it created this whole very complicated mechanism to constantly monitor the carbon footprint of the corporate issuers that 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 it was it was going to tear to and from. And that to me, and this is back to Chandra's question, that to me is a very good, good example of institutional mechanisms for discipline that involve monitoring of carbon footprints. This is quite unprecedented. I don't know many, very, any central bank that, that did had this ambition on a scale. And if you can talk to your friends, please, in, in climate movements, rather than pushing them into the MNT direction, I think a, a less ambitious step would be to pressure the ECB to go back to something that already exists okay. and they abandoned under political pressure from the right. Yeah, stop it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.